Good morning and welcome, friends. Uh, this lodge has a meeting at 11 a.m. every Sunday morning uh, for the presentation of a to topic by a student of, of the philosophy. And on the first and third Sundays of the month, we're studying the key to theosophy by H.P.B. Blavatsky. The movement that um, brought out the um, 19th century effort uh, continues today. Um, the books um, of HPB are still available. Um, you can go to our website and peruse it um, for more information. The Declaration of United Lodge of Theosophists um, is a guide to all of the students and it states the policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement, but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, is similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution, bylaws, nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis. And it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition or organization, and it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect yet belongs to each and all. The following is the form signed by associates of the ULT. Being in sympathy with the purposes of this lodge as set forth in its declaration, I hereby record my desire to be enrolled as an associate, it being understood that such association calls for no obligation on my part, other than that which I myself determine. Today's reading comes from um, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. Then said Almitra, speak to us of love. And he raised his head and looked upon the people, and there fell a stillness upon them. And with a great voice he said, when love beckons to you, follow him. Though his ways are hard and steep, and when his wings enfold you, yield to him. Though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. And when he speaks to you, believe in him. Though his voice may shatter your dreams as the north wind lays waste the garden. For even as love crowns you, so shall he crucify you. Even as he is for your growth, so he is for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun, so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. Like sheaves of corn, he gathers you unto himself. He threshes you to make you naked. He sits you to bury you. He sifts you to free you from your husks. He grinds you to whiteness. He kneads you until you are pliant. And then he assigns you to his sacred fire that you may become sacred bread 
for God's sacred feast. All these things shall love do unto you, that you may know the thick secrets of your heart. And in that knowledge become a fragment of life's heart. But if in your fear you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, then it is better for you that you cover your nakedness and pass out of love's threshing floor into the seasonless world where you shall laugh but not all of your laughter and weep but not all of your tears. Love gives not but itself and takes not but from itself. Love possesses not, nor would it be possessed. For love is sufficient unto love. When you love, you should not say, God is in my heart, but rather, I am in the heart of God. And think not you can direct the course of love, for love, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. Love has no other desire but to fulfill itself. But if you love and must needs have desires, let these be your desires. To melt and be like a running brook that sings its melody to the night. To know the pain of too much tenderness. To be wounded by your own understanding of love. And to bleed willingly and joyfully. To wake at dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving. To rest at noon hour and meditate love's ecstasy. To return home at eventide with gratitude. And then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise upon your lips. And now today's talk, love. Welcome, friends. In understanding love, we must look towards the height and perfection of all being. In other words, what constitutes an adept? What is the love that is expressed by the perfected? Love in the abstract, directed solely to the eternal and the infinite, is love of all things without distinction in the universe, without giving preference to any one of them. But could this be the same as being equal to loving nothing at all, we might ask? To love all equally is to, perhaps to love nothing? This is one of the great philosophical questions that we grapple with. This type of love exists, but it's beyond the conception of the human mind. It's the eternal love as that depicted in philosophy. Love of form, on the other hand, with an, of an object, form uh, an object, is what the human mind grapples with. Why? Because we attach ourselves to objects, to illusions, through love. As soon as we love one thing, it becomes separated from the whole. Does this love not detract from other things and other forms and objects? Whether or not these objects are actual physical things or personalities which are temporary, or even ideas. The Gita teaches us that one should not be attached to objects, whether through love or hate, but to renounce all attachments and live in the eternal. It extols equal-mindedness and says, he is esteemed who is equal-minded to companions, friends, enemies, strangers, to family, to good and evil men. And he whose soul is united by devotion, seeing all in all, and all in the soul, sees indeed. He sees me everywhere and in everything, and everything in me, whether pleasant or unpleasant. On almost every page of the Gita, we are instructed to direct our love to that which is eternal in every form, and let the form itself be a matter of secondary consideration. He must be regarded as a steadfast renouncer who neither hates nor desires and sees no difference between a Brahmin, a cow, an elephant, a dog, or one who eats the flesh of dogs. 
Do not rejoice in attaining what is pleasant, nor grieve over attaining what is unpleasant, being fixed in mind, untroubled, knowing the one and abiding, abiding therein. What can all this mean but that love is the legitimate object of love? It is a divine, eternal, and infinite power, a light, which reflects itself in every object while it seeks not the object itself. It is an indestructible fire, and the brighter it burns, the stronger will be the light, and the clearer its own image appears. Love falls in love with nothing but its own self, free from all other attractions. A love which becomes attached to objects ceases to be free, ceases to love, and becomes mired in numerous desires, becomes a force of desire, begetting an endless series of manifestations and illusions. Pure divine love, that which is eternal, asks for nothing, but gives freely to all. Earthly love, on the other hand, is attracted to persons and things, personalities, that which is temporary and illusory. Divine love seeks only itself, or that element which is divine in everything, the supreme. This power of love holds together the worlds in space. It clothes the earth in all its colors. It guides the instincts of animals harmoniously and links together the hearts of all human beings. Acting on the lower planes, it causes terrestrial things to cling to each other with fond embrace. This we can see in small children and animals. There's an instantaneous expression of loving nature. Spiritual love, though, may be likened unto a goddess who continually sacrifices herself for herself and who accepts no other sacrifice but her own, giving for whatever she may receive herself in return. Love is a universal power and therefore immortal. It can never die. We cannot believe that even the smallest particle of love ever died. Only the instruments or forms through which it becomes manifest change their form. Nor will it ever be born because it exists from eternity. The bodies into which it shines are born and die and are born again. Love is light and light shines everywhere. There is no such thing as a light that doesn't shine. When light shines, it shines upon all, the just and the unjust. It draws no distinction. It shines on the lands of the righteous as well as that of criminals. Similar to the rain, it makes no distinction. It just falls. It just is. It doesn't look for a specific thing to shine upon. It just freely gives. Wherever a good and perfect human being exists, there is divine love manifest. And the degree of man's perfection will depend upon the degree of his capacity to serve as an instrument for the manifestation of this divine love. The more perfect he is, the more will his love penetrate all who come within his divine influence. To ask favors of God in prayer, as it's commonly used, is to conceive of him, with a capital H, as an imperfect being whose love is not free, but subject to the guidance of and preference to mortals, preference to certain uh, desires. To expect favors of a god is to conceive of him imperfectly. To expect favors of a Mahatma or an adept is to conceive of him as an imperfect man. Thus, true prayer is an elevation and aspiration of the soul in spirit and in truth, not because prayer can persuade a God or the light to shine on us, but because it will assist us in opening our eyes to the light that is already there. Let those who want to know the Mahatmas follow their doctrines, to seek for love, but not for a temporary object of love. True seekers will find love in everything that exists, for love is the foundation of all existence, and without love, nothing can continue to exist. Love is the source of life, 
and light and happiness. It's the creative principle in the macrocosm and the microcosm. Love is like Venus, mother of the will and imagination and all other powers by which the universe evolved. It's the germ of divinity which exists in the hearts of men and which may develop into a life-giving sun, illuminating the mind and sending its rays to the center of the universe. It, that light, like the Logos, originates from uh, a center which is everywhere, and to that center it will return. It's like a divine messenger who carries light from heaven down to the earth and returns to heaven loaded with sacrificial gifts. Love on earth is worshipped by all. Some adore it in one form and some in another. But many perceive only the form and do not perceive the divine spirit within. The form is illusion, and love can exist without a form, but yet forms cannot exist without love. The form is crystallized spirit, light reflected in matter. Forms can arouse desire, and desire is the producer of form. Thus, the visible world of perishable things is created and comes about, becomes a cycle. Uh, desire first arose in it. From desire is the creation of form. We need to seek for the love that sustains all and not to mistake the essence for the form. Love is like a flame. When it lights another, it's in no way diminished. Love is eternal and perishable. It sustains, nourishes all. And yet, it's also the ground on which all things depend. It has no limits. Its intensity towards one does not limit it in regard to another. It does not, um, the fervor of love uh, stimulates one to further effort. True love has no jealousies, no exclusivity. It's not overexcited. It has no anxiety about loss, questions not whether it will be reciprocated or returned and takes ingratitude or appreciation with an equal satisfaction. It is complete in itself and is its own perfect reward to him who knows it. We often deceive ourselves in love towards individuals, mistaking the human for the divine, and this is the human condition. We need to sit down and contemplate searching questions before we can know ourselves for sure on this point. Sometimes the human lover, especially in regard to the opposite sex, deceives himself. Is he under the glamour cast by form? In such a case, the love is not bad, but only partakes of the divine partially. We shall probably find that to no individual do we hold a love that is unalloyed, but that has something of the human element in it. And that signifies that there is some selfishness there. Human love has a selfish element because it's tainted by some aspect of possession or wanting to be exclusive. And as such, is not the full picture of love. It's the opposite of the divine element. But that love can be transmuted into divine love. And that is the work of humanity on earth. This is the work we're all doing on earth, the work of humanity. The road from one to the other kind of love can be strewn with pitfalls, with sophistry of the most subtle kinds of deception, and few are those who truly discern such pitfalls. Innumerable have been the earnest men and pilgrims, founders of sects and religions and philosophies, which have had very, you know, much good in them, but who have come to grief themselves and led others astray. Calm and equal-minded needs to be the one who contemplates the truth of his mind, separating the wheat from the chaff, 
the divine and the selfless from the human and the selfish. HPB called human love egoism a deux. In French, egoism. Because we often think of love, we think of two, an exclusive and destructive love, whether between husband and wife, mother and child, between brother and brother, or between friends. Such love may bring a temporary pleasure for the personality, but it's displeasing to the Ishwara within, as it could sunder the soul from its divine parentage and its true mission. It hinders more than it helps the intellectual love of God, the constant love of wisdom extolled by the adepts, Krishna, Buddha, Christ, and so forth. He who loves only himself lives in hell, the hell of loneliness, ambition, and despair. On the other hand, he who loves only one other person lives entirely on earth, and all such earthly love must come to an end. At best, it could correspond to uh, the illusion that characterizes Devahan, the after-death states. He who loves his fellow men on earth in a heavenly condition, but just as long as his philanthropy and altruism are purely personal, again, it's temporary. It may be a prolonged and beautiful dream, but an illusory condition that brings the soul no nearer to its true quest. The true love is the love of self. All caps. The one life. Amidst all the conditions of earthly life. Finite personal love is not bad in itself, but it's frustrating to the soul and useless unless it can be purified and made more impersonal and, and unselfish. Only in this way can love be transformed from a divisive tendency in human relationships into a non-violent and unifying power that produces strength, peace, and as the Gita says, equal mindedness. The human ego, we have to consider where in the theosophical principles we're acting from. The human ego is neither atma nor buddhi, but higher manas, the intellectual fruition and efflorescence of self-conscious egotism in the higher sense. So we know that we're talking the human soul is at the level of mind, higher mind, because mind is dual. It can be attracted towards the higher, towards Atma, Buddhi, the light, or it can be attracted to the lower mind, which is the desire principle, called Kama in Sanskrit, or the Kama element, as opposed to the higher, the Mahatmic element. <clears throat> so, the ancient works refer to this higher mind, so to speak, as the Sutratman, the, the thread soul, where all the beads of every life are strung. heard this term, the thread soul, sutratman, or sutratma, thread soul. And the various personalities of the higher ego are strung like beads upon it. This imperishable thread of the sutratman is radiant, and it's Manas that serves man as like uh, a medium between the higher and the lower, the spiritual man and the physical brain. When the lunar aspect of Manas is um, activated, it becomes comic. And when it is directed towards the higher, it becomes like Mahat or Mahatmic, like the Mahatmas. 
this is a way we could see that humans are in a, uh, at this stage in a pivotal point, uh, um, stage of evolution where we actively have to make an effort to purify the lower to go to the higher because as we know self-induced and self-devised effort is required that um, um, evolution no longer propels by natural impulse as it does up until the animal kingdom. <clears throat> when the lunar aspect of Manas is activated and the comic principle is, is the light is shown there, it's possessed of creative fire, but it's that creative fire that begets desire and continual form and desire, and that becomes, as was said, unsatisfactory to the soul. The distinction here between finite love and the more enduring love, which is a link between, we could also say, passion and compassion, finally can be culminated into the highest spiritual love. When Kama and man overcomes and enslaves the mind, the manas, love becomes uh, separative, it becomes selfish, it becomes cunning. It becomes a form of sentimental wish fulfillment, like prayer when it's directed towards oneself for special favors. That, that doesn't take into account uh, that the universal principle shines on all equally. It can become a violent force, an explosion of all the passions pent up in man, and it knows neither restraint, um, and it, it, it can bring up you know, this undercurrent of animal passions, and that sort of cuts one off from compassion. Um, the higher love, uh, we could say sattvic love that is towards the self of all and is compassion um, gives to all equally like the light that shines on all it is not expecting anything in return it is not separative it does not it's cooling it's not a, there's no undercurrent of um, frustration but more of a soothing uh, cooling effect um, in the Book of Confidences, uh, it said that when thou shalt find true love, shalt find one homogeneous to thy nature, to whom all life is consecrate, who will have ardency to take with thee the bright track of the soul, and in that embodiment of thine own love, shalt find all others for thy love, thy joy, thy patience, and compassion. It's sort of a poetic way of saying it. The comic love, the passionate love, can arise only when um, Manas is under the influence of Kama, and at times in intermittently. Um, and the reverse, we said, was Manas when it tends towards Buddhi. This type of love is silent rather than clamorous in its expression. It's marked by an inward depth rather than by an outward display. The silences of love lie in wait for us night and day at our threshold, and those who have loved deeply in this way come to learn many secrets that are unknown to others. The secrets of sharing and sacrifice and duty well done. Love is the moving power of life itself, and nothing can exist without the love that drives everything towards everything else that is. He alone who loves, lives. Love is the drive towards the unity of the separated, and separation presupposes an original unity. The active and creative element in love is the urge of the human soul to participate in the work of cosmic and human evolution. It's a form of creation, of kriya shakti, that enables man to emulate um, the Mahatmas, the adepts, and the host of creative intelligences um, that oversee the universe. Human love could become a bridge between the animal and the divine aspects of love, 
provided the desire to ascend through lower to higher forms is continually nourished and sustained. The voice of the silence points to the highest kind of love, which transcends the three qualities. The constant love of the absolute, eternal truth, to compassion with a capital C, which is the law of laws, embracing the entire universe. We can progress gradually from human love to divine love, from, as it's said in the, the voice, uh, Donna is the key of charity, compassion, that's the first step, um, that's rooted in the eternal and absolute truth. True love is a creative force also, but it emanates from the one life, light, logos, and its expression is under the universal love, cosmic and human interdependence. As said in the Key to Theosophy, as mankind is essentially of one and the same essence, and that essence is one, infinite, uncreate, and eternal, whether we call it God or nature, nothing therefore can affect one nature or one man without affecting all other nations and all other men. In other words, unity. Love, true love, divine love is based on unity. Any type of love that um, breaks with unity um, becomes, um, you know, downward tending. So we may recognize that we have those loves. That's okay. We're in the human condition. But how can we gradually purify them, um, return it to a state of unity? Expect nothing in return. Just give love for the pleasure of giving love for its own sake, as was read in the... Um, um, in the prophet in the reading earlier. True love can never be a divisive force, but always has a universal uh, unifying effect. It leads in the end to that love of wisdom, the light of the Logos, which has been extolled by all the sages and mystics of all ages. True love is constant and immortal because it springs from the immortal and steadfast nature of the human soul. We all come from the one, and essentially we say that that is unity, we say it's law, we say, uh, we can also say it's love. The universe seeks to express love to itself, so to speak. Um, there is in the Book of Confidences a section on love, and it's between the maiden and the sage, and she asks, you know, O oh sage, my heart tells me to seek your counsel, but my reason, yet my reason would abstain. You know, know that I would ask concerning love. And the sage says, hearts loves of many ageless pasts may dwell even in an ascetic soul. Found in the heart is not love alone, but knowledge. Nay, love is knowledge. If love be in thy heart, what need hast thou to ask of love? She replies, um, thus soon thy words resolve the doubt. I thought I loved two suitors for my hand, and now I see that I can love them neither. And he replies, well, it may be so, but not surely. One instant veil might fall away from before the still shrine of thy soul, and thou mightest see in new light from of old a companion of the future in one of these men. Might be not till yet another life is destined to return to the a fitting mate. In other words, n neither of them might be it. It might happen in another incarnation, the student is, thinks. <laughs> but when the gods do hide their intent from thee, seek to tear aside the veil. Let love come in train of the good law, in order of great nature. Be sought not, flouted not, but come as waking comes in the sweet springtime dawn. In other words, just, sounds like he's saying just 
just let love flow out of your heart like you welcome a beautiful morning, new spring day. It, don't look for it as what will be pleasing necessarily to the personality. So she says, do you promise I shall truly know love when it comes? And the sage says, assuredly, thou may rest on this. Love is an initiation. If thou knowest it not, it is not love. We've talked about initiation before, but never in the context of love, and it seems like a really interesting way to approach it. So the young maiden says, Tell me then, Father, what love should be. For many have I known went smiling to a life of promised joy, hand fast in hand, who found but pain and disillusionment, not love. And the sage says, They, one or other, or might be both of them, loved the land of pleasant dreams. They sought for happiness alone, not to be worthy of the great initiation. They sought not knowledge of the soul of each, nor knowledge of the great pulsing heart within all of nature. And she says, But Father, surely there are few in days of youth who care to speak the things of mind and soul. I weary grow at times and find myself lonely and apart in thought from those who ever chatter, chatter cleverly and make their mirth of coarse, unseemly things. They even make um, mock of love. So she's not, she's wondering if there's others like her, you know. She sees people, maybe it's love, she's not sure. She sees them, you know, um, maybe in love. The sage says, when thou shalt find true love, shalt find one homogeneous to thy nature, to whom all life is consecrate, who will have ardency to take with thee the bright track of the soul. And in that embodiment of thine own love, shalt find all others for thy love, thy joy, thy patience, and compassion. Thou shalt know thy love is true, if thou art a friend to him, mother, sister, daughter, and companion. If to thee thy needs of friend and father, son and brother, all find fulfillment in him. Yet leave the doors flung wide to the world of all friends, fathers, sons, and brothers, all mothers, sisters, daughters, to know in all a deeper kinship and to make thee tenderer, wiser, and more thoughtful to thine own near karmic bond. Never can true love be ministrant where it is exclusive, where happiness is sought for two alone. Never where is sense of possession, be it of body, mind, soul, of house or wealth. Never where is demanding of the other what may be taken only in participation, the gift of life and law and duty. In duties of the mated state, to family and race, well fulfilled though love of the great self of all creatures, there doth prepare a new embodiment of valor and virtue in the world. Wise ones of all the past in ancient times came down to save man, to save to man pure household fires, that from them might be kindled the sacred altar fire of service to mankind. In other words, the sage is saying, Make your love such that you come together with the other person, not just as husband and wife, but as friends, as brothers, sisters, as fulfilling all the archetypal relationships and seek together to um, kindle the sacred altar fire of service, love to mankind. She says, duty seems like a harsh word to mine ears. And I would have and love the greatest joy. Can that be bad? And he says, can the natural be wrong? Must duty kill out joy? Or joy be incompatible with duty? But I speak of joy that is enduring. Of duty that is blessing. And both that binds not two, but all hearts to the whole. Such love must be rare to find, she says. And he replies, rare as is the flower of the Udambara tree. Yet for all that, she asks, might one then not take a lesser love? 
And in closing, he says, It depends, O daughter. It depends on how bright the flame of self-sacrifice burneth in thy heart. It depends on how steadfastly thou canst abide by chosen course. It depends on need thou knowest to, to exist in other lives concerned have been those who saw the karmic marks of destiny, who dared fulfill those stepping into shade themselves, who helped others find the skyline by that course, and in themselves a greater love disclosed, undreamed of, radiant galaxies of space. And that was so poetic, it's hard to d digest. She says, O oh, Reverend Sage, may I see the truth and do my whole duty, if ever the chalice of love's sweet waters, or scant or generous, be pressed unto my lips. Unwitting, I craved sure counsel of thee, who in universal love knoweth all love's lesser joys and beauties. For thy wisdom now, my gratitude. So he answered a question, but in a sense, he asked more questions than he answered. <laughs> And perhaps that is what we should um, end with on love, that though we think we n might know what it is, it might be an idea that we're fascinated with, an idea of love. But that true love, uh, divine love, is at the level of the self of all, of light, law, unity, and uh, just remember the, the, the light, it shines on all equally. It doesn't shine more here and less over there. It shines regardless. And it does it every, like the sun every day without distinction. Though there might be clouds in the way, the sun is still shining. So with that, we'll end and ask you know, uh, for um, comments and questions about love. Well... In another talk we had discussed um, Sat, Sheet, and Ananda being the core of the universe. May we not suppose that this love comes from that blissful condition? Yes. The student would say that they would be, that's another way of expressing it, that uh, um, Sat, in some of the articles, there was an idea of tamasic love, rajasic love, sattvic love, and that which is beyond the three qualities, as the Gita is always um, admonishing. And that um, how to uh, maybe understand ourselves in terms of some of our loves might be at different levels, but as long as we have that desire to transmute them and to do... Uh, the work of understanding life through love, through being worthy of understanding more, then we could say we're, we're doing what we can. And that, um, but to know that there is this, um, this bliss that is uh, built on unity and law is ultimately um, it seems like where where we should be headed. To follow up, you put love equals initiation. Well, in order to truly know what's, well, um, let's put it another way. We always refer to the Christ principle being in each human heart. We point to the physical heart, but it really is not in the physical heart. It's in the invisible heart, is it not? Well, isn't that heart also correspondent with, with the universal core of our um, universe? Not just the solar system, but the whole universe. You, we al you always refer to um, uh, Atman and then to the Lokoic light. So this initiation is necessary then to get to know that Christ principle in the heart, which is the universal self, that as you put it up, could we not look at it that way? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that, um, that center from where the light of the Logos comes out is the same as the center within each of us. It's no different. It's not separate, even. Mm -hmm. It is that center.
So then also initiation seems to be an internal process to each human heart. It's not an external process, it's an internal process that we get initiated to know who truly we are. Yeah, and it was interesting that, um, you know, in the Book of Confidences, the sage said, you may rest on this, love is an initiation. Mm -hmm. If thou knowest it not, it is not love. So that brings us back to the idea that once we see the light that is already there, which is what initiation is, we understand that we are already capable. We are God's um, already, that um, we've limited ourselves so that that initiation, while it's internal, it, it's something we'll absolutely recognize. It's not like something different from outside. It's who we really are. It's coming closer to understanding, remembering, ex re-experiencing uh, who we really are, that fundamental unity. Yeah, it's based on unity, as you said, because uh, that Sutra Man, its um, affinity is to the logoic light. It's not separate from it. it. When you look at the sun and look at the rays coming out of it, uh, it still looks like they're joined to the core of the sun, and it, it flows outward. Well, it's the same thing with the Sutra Man. It's, it's uh, affinities to that core it comes from. So after this uh, experience that we go through, as you specified, uh, we come from there, and then when we are ready, we return to it. It's a long journey, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if one was to think of the Sutratma, the thread with the beads of every life on it, what would that mean if you could take the essence of all those beads? Um, it's greater than the sum of its parts. It's a process of transmutation um, that the soul does over many, many, many lifetimes. But it gives a little hope. Okay. It said that uh, love conquers all. Like, uh, I don't know if you heard it. You said it in those words, but I've heard that statement a lot. And, it's, and I think we're talking about this kind of love, the unselfish type of love. When we try to get it to the personal level, it's just like our lower tendencies, passions and desires and all that. And it gets mixed up in that. And then we have the, the constant fight to, to get it back to that uh, level that you're talking about. Um, yeah, it begets... I mean, once put in these terms, it, it seems helpful. It begets an endless series of manifestations and produces illusion and enmeshing in um, ideas and emotions. And it, it's not, it just it doesn't go anywhere. It just becomes, you know, a, sort of a downward cycle. Um, but, and it's not that, it's bad, we need to experience that as human beings, but to understand that we can um, purify it and, and not just get stuck there. It's like a rut, you can get stuck in a rut. Mm -hmm. So but, recognize, like you said, recognize that as an opportunity. I guess we need that, to have that opportunity to, to, to grow, self-growth. How could we understand ourselves if we didn't go through that? It's. I mean, that's why, um, you know, the fundamentals of the secret doctrine is that every soul makes this pilgrimage to sort of understand itself, an endless series of um, reincarnations and the cycle of necessity. Um, yeah, it's, the, it's essentially the big question, why? Why are we here? What are we, why all this? Why are we interacting with each other? What are we supposed to learn? So while all the articles kept emphasizing divine love and human love, it seemed good to emphasize, yeah, that there's no, we shouldn't be like, oh, it's bad, but it is what it is and it can be transmuted to compassion, to give without expecting anything in return. It's 
calming, it's placid, it's not like a, um, all those passions that, you know, anger leads to other emotions, which, you know, and it just becomes explosive. Well, you know, we see that uh, destructive force in our own societal uh, lives, because there's a lot of people killing one another uh, because the one person uh, does not remain in the relationship, the other one decides that uh, possession, I think, is uh, there, uh, that uh, she should not be free to go. Now, that, to me, is very destructive. That's not really love. That's uh, that passionate compulsiveness where you must possess the other person. I think there's that saying, if you love something, set it free and yeah. come back, as yeah. opposed to that, you know, desire for uh, exclusiveness. To, hold, to grab, yeah. uh, to it, own. Yeah. But unless we talk about it, I guess everybody experiences it, but unless we talk about it, reflect on it, people don't realize it's just, you know, it becomes a, like maybe a habit because it's promoted in the society and you s one sees others doing it but that's what's good about philosophy and theosophy is to sort of bring it to a higher level yeah. <clears throat> yeah. we often think of hate is the opposite of love but if I understand what you're saying here love is divine Hate is man-made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the opposite of love really is more like indifference, <coughs> not hatred. Love encompasses all, cares about all aspects. Indifference is total exclusion, doesn't care. So we have all these different levels of love that we experience throughout our day, throughout our week, throughout our life, and um, just to try and, um, you know, understand what they are and, and raise it to a higher level. This is not easy work, though. Um, this is probably the most difficult. It's, it's just natural to seek for the pleasant aspects of love and to shun the uh, the more painful ones, but it all could be, um, it could be a joyous learning. Okay. <laughs> In the passage that you were reading between the sage and the lady, uh, duty came in there, and she, she did not think that was an attractive <laughs> word. <laughs> She's like, that's not what I was thinking. Perhaps you would like to like read that little bit there. Duty uh, <laughs> seems oft times a harsh word to mine ears. Yeah. And I would have in love the greatest joy. Can such joy be sinful? He says, can that natural, in other words, can that which is natural be wrong? Must duty kill out joy or joy be incompatible with duty? I speak of joy that is enduring, of duty that is blessing, in the bond that binds not two, but all hearts to the whole. That's very important. <laughs> But perhaps once we realize that um, our heart is joined to all the other hearts, perhaps that's the first step to realizing that we're not separate, we're united. So how we treat one another becomes really a duty in the sense that we need to treat people with equal mindedness and, and that love. Because we're all united, we are essentially able to experience right. love that others are experiencing. So then the duty becomes to do the right thing by every occasion that comes our way and look at it as an opportunity for what you just read, rather than shunning it. Yeah, okay. you, you said the big thing is to get away from the idea of likes and dislikes and all that other stuff, the lower, lower level, wow, um, the lower level well, of things question. that you live with every day, because that doesn't define uh, at the highest level is what you're talking about, the spiritual level. If we're thinking in terms of likes and dislikes, we're not thinking at that higher level at all. 
We might not even be thinking. Might not even be <laughs> thinking. <you're sure. laughs> but you know, to expand on that, you can say I love this music because it helps me reach to higher states. I love theosophy because it helps me reach to higher states of being. As you progress, you, divine love, I guess it's an unspeakable thing, and they say you let go of everything as you, you know, ascend. You, I don't know how it, it happens, but I feel like that's, you know, knowledge is also, like this, these are words which are temporary, so it's interesting <laughs> how, you know, you, as you go along, from my understanding, you let go of everything, you become detached, mm -hmm. you know, you, it's instead of attachment, you become more detached, but that's not a bad thing. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah, it's like... Yeah, it's not indifference, it's not right. detachment, but it's something, nothing and everything, as you know. Right, by giving up a thing, we can gain all. Yes. That's the message. Because it was talking about, like, at the beginning, love in the abstract. If it's directed solely towards the infinite, isn't that the same as loving nothing at all? Mm. No. I mean, it seems like uh, that's one of the sort of pitfalls of um, contemplating divine love from the standpoint of human love. But um, the eternal love as depicted in philosophy is just as we could say it's we could say it's a joining and we are naturally um, attached or gravitated to attach to um, uh, things of a like nature um, it's it's vibrational so uh, but we can um, we can choose our vibrations so to speak and in every circumstance, this, maybe the same vibration isn't required. We have to become versatile in all the uh, vibrations that are within the spectrum that are available to us. Um, we, it would be silly to think the Mahatma only uses one vibration. He uses them all, and it, it can become a symphony, understanding music was required by initiates to understand how vibration, light, sound blends. Then we come up with chords and, um, you know, all the ways that sounds can combine. And, uh, you know, even the voice of the silence, every key is given a sound. So um, I think bringing that into it, that we are learning about all the different levels of uh, vibration even, you know, through human love, um, just to understand that there's um, every note we express can be in harmony with the whole. Um, I'm sensing a great paradox that in these thought-provoking times, many people are still not yet thinking, and some people are still not yet loving and I wonder why that is well that's a good question um, because it's really an important question because all like babies and animals like was mentioned spontaneously are loving it said HPB said that the first sort of feeling the first humanity had for its, um, you know, uh, what's the word, not predecessors, but from where we came was a feeling of devotion. It was spontaneous. And where has it gone? Um, where does it go? Um, is it because the examples around us? Um, is it because we aren't true to ourselves? Is it a combination? Certainly, the more examples we can enact and point to and look towards will help all others. Um, and, I mean, it's difficult because it's wrapped up in karma and uh, causes and effects we've set in motion from a long time. But 
Uh, this student thinks it's possible, at least, to um, at least to move in that direction. And the more examples we can we can show others of of the possibilities, the better. Because it, it's true. It's maybe maybe um, I don't know not to like not to be like harsh on parents, but maybe parents let let their kids get away with being um, not with not with maybe they let them get away with settling for something less. Maybe because they don't know any better. So then does it become upon those who know the burden of responsibility to share this uh, philosophy, this information and to point point to it wherever we see it, whether it's in a song in pop culture or um, you know, wherever we find it. How does this tie in with come and be ye separate? I mean, or does it, does it make a difference? Or does it tie in? Yeah, uh, just not not um, not doing what everybody else is doing, but that doesn't mean you don't love. That just means you you have a path that uh, you reflect that you on. see as the correct path. Yeah, and we might find as we get to a higher stage that we were somewhat mistaken, and we'll adjust our course. Change our path. Yeah. But that's okay. That's that's all we can really expect. <laughs> you know that we're growing and learning. So it gets back to the middle attitude, attitude toward things. Absolutely. As we go. Mm -hmm. So with that, well, um, yeah, our time's up. We can continue the conversation, and then um, next week. Sorry, I don't know what's next week. Easter. Oh, oh, right. It's Easter next week, so there'll be discussion on the symbolism, a talk on the yeah. symbolism of Easter, and uh, we hope you'll join us then. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.